Hello everyone. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Uh, welcome to Pragmatic Talks by Pragmatic Leaders. And today we have Andrew with us. Uh, we are going to discuss about running a data-driven product organization with Andrew today. Uh, before starting, I would like to give you a little brief about Andrew. He is currently working with Skidulu, uh, which is a platform for intelligent mobile workforce management. He has a very interesting journey till now. He has worked with various brands like Yammer, Microsoft, and many more. So let's start the session. And hi, Andrew, I would like you to take the session forward from here. I'm giving you the access, and you can share your screen. Hey, thanks, Piyush. We'll, uh, we'll work through the, uh, the sharing in a second here. Uh, if I, uh, I am, of course, American, and I'm from the uh, uh, south in the US, so I do talk a little funny and a little fast. <laughs> so if, uh, if I'm talking too fast for anybody, please uh, just uh, raise your hand or send in a comment. Uh, I'll, I'll try and uh, slow down. <laughs> yes. Oh uh, yeah. So uh, welcome uh, and thanks for everybody for coming. I know it's uh, it's pretty late over there. Uh, this is a, a talk that um, came from actually a discussion I was having with a a PM at the company Foursquare, um, basically around uh, data driven product, how uh, our industry had adopted data and how it was actually working. You know, the the funny thing that I find is actually even most product managers that I interviewed today, even downtown San Francisco, where you assume, you know, data drives everything, uh, is actually still not all that common. Uh, and I think that's a big challenge for our, our career and our industry if we can't kind of move forward uh, on, on this data level topic. So I've kind of taken it up as my, my mission to go and kind of preach this around the world and uh, uh, make sure that, you know, people really understand data, why we're using it, what we use it for, um, and kind of help to uh, to up level uh, the whole concept. Hi, right, so I'm I'm Drew. Uh, that's my Twitter handle there, Drew Dill. Uh, I am the Chief Product Officer at Schedulo, which means that I run product engineering and design uh, currently, which is a team of uh, of 35 people that are actually all based in Australia. So uh, actually, not even here in San Francisco where I live. Um, it's a multinational company, so we've got a lot of different offices. Um, but it just so happens that I uh, I work here because here's where most of the customers are. Uh, prior to this, I was VP of Product at AnyPerk, which is an HR uh, company that offers benefits uh, to their employees. And uh, and I was Director of Product at Yammer. So I was employee number 60 at Yammer um, through 450 in the acquisition by Microsoft, which is where I learned most of this. It's always worth, I think, pointing out that I'm not a statistician, although we're going to be talking a lot about stats and stuff today. Actually, my initial, my first career was actually in design, um, later from design to being a computer science major um, through college. I uh, came out and did a bunch of uh, engineering jobs after that. Quickly realized engineering wasn't my real passion or my, my primary skill set and actually went into sales. And it turns out if you kind of average those things together, uh, you have a pretty good product management resume. So although I'll be talking a lot about data and numbers and things like that, these are all things that I picked up on the job and, and things that other people can as well. Uh, so a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the first piece I'll call the character of data, what can it do for us and what it can't. Uh, next, how to collect data, uh, what exactly we want to measure when we collect data, and then uh, some of the uses of data for driving insights uh, to dashboards and reporting, uh, multivariate testing or A-B testing, um, and how to kind of interpret and understand the results that you get from your A-B testing system. Uh, and then we'll do a really, really, we'll, we'll stick our uh, big toes into machine learning, but we won't go too deep into that because it's uh, obviously an extremely deep topic. So something that happens, you know, as we, as we see consumer companies go from, you know, four people in a room up through their IPO and, and become Become these massive global organizations, we know that they take this journey of, of understanding and using data, that they take it from, uh, you know, those, those four people in a dorm room not understanding anything about what their users do to kind of these uh, massive global systems of understanding and crunching millions of pieces of information and transactional data, that they use it to drive kind of every part of their organization. But nobody really understands like that, that path. How do you get from the dorm room to this massive data crunching machine? Uh, and, and what are the pieces and component steps and, and why do they do that? Oop. 
So what we really want to talk about first is kind of the character of data. What can data tell us? What can data do? You know, I, I think the best way to think about your data is really looking at and understanding user data, um, looking at what your users are doing on the app, how you can optimize that, and how to think about that. And the first thing to think about is that data, as you collect it, is ultimately a history book. Uh, it tells you what happened in the past. Uh, it tells you what your users did on the site. It tells you where they came from, where they went, what they clicked on, what pages they viewed. Data tell, can tell you basically anything a user did uh, within your application, but it really is, it's a history book. And so as you think of history, you can think of uh, something like, uh, this is the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Uh, his, uh, his assassination was widely blamed uh, as the cause of the start of World War I. Um, and you can you can theorize, you can say, okay, if we go back in the past and we stopped Archduke Franz Ferdinand from being assassinated, would there still have been a World War I? Well, we don't, we don't really know that. Data can give us a feeling for that, but we can't know because that's, that's a correlation. That's not a causal, uh, not necessarily a causal relationship. Uh, you can also go back in the past and make an inference and say, okay, so when a world leader gets assassinated, that drives conflict, that creates war, uh, you know, there's a battle that happens after that. Uh, and you could look, and even if every single time that happened in the past, you can't actually know that that, happened in the, that will happen again in the future because your data is a history book. It tells you what happened in the past, and it, it isn't necessarily predictive. It can give you hints of that, but it can't tell you 100% that that is what happened uh, or why it happened. Uh, so although we want to look back and say, okay, users did this, and it drove this kind of behavior, and it led to this kind of outcome, uh, the first thing you need to know about data is that it, it can't necessarily tell you that. It, it can't give you that, that surety. Uh, here's a, there's a funny website called uh, Spurious Correlations, uh, and it takes two graphs that look kind of similar and maps them over top of each other. Uh, so here's one that's uh, the divorce rate in Maine versus the per capita consumption of margarine. And it turns out those graphs look very similar. And, and you can, uh, the, the point here is that you can look at two things uh, that look very similar uh, and not necessarily know exactly uh, <laughs> that those things, obviously these two aren't related and there's no way that per capita consumption of margarine uh, drives divorces in Maine. Uh, but if you only have your data and your data is just a history book of what happened, there's no way to make this, this, this leap. You would have to then go and find a way of testing whether uh, somebody eating more margarine makes them get divorced. <laughs> So with that said, what, what can data tell us? What, what can we learn about our applications and the things that we build based on, our, on the data that we get? Well, first off, the most obvious, what areas of the product are getting the most use and how? Uh, where are the eyeballs going? Where are users clicking? You know, if you're tracking page data, you're tracking activities and engagement with your site, uh, they're gonna, you're gonna see obvious numbers of where people are going and what they're clicking on. And that, that's really useful just for even understanding what users want. Uh, they can tell you how you're doing. We'll talk a, a bit in a moment about defining your, your kind of key performance indicators, your KPI, uh, as to success of, of your app. Uh, and they'll, your data can basically map to those as well as you understand your current KPI. Uh, it can tell you the outcome of a scientific experiment. I, I mentioned just a moment ago that when, you know, if I were to figure out if margarine and divorce rates in Maine were the same, that I'd want to, I'd want to test that somehow. Uh, so when you see a correlation in the data, that doesn't mean you, you should throw it out. What that means is that there might be something interesting there, uh, but you need to basically conduct as scientific an experiment as possible to figure out uh, whether the, that relationship actually might be causal. Uh, this one's kind of magical. Uh, data can actually tell you whether a feature sucks. And this is something you'll hear a lot as a, as a product manager. Um, nobody uses search because search sucks. Uh, it's kind of hard to make a good search. There are actually better tools for, uh, for search these days than, uh, than in the past. But um, what you will find, if something sucks, then if somebody uses it, they won't use it again. If, it, if it's bad, they won't return and continue using it. And they won't even, they'll likely actually, it'll negatively impact their impression of your total app. So those people are likely to become less engaged over time if they're using things that don't work. So when somebody tells you that search sucks, the easiest thing to then go do is say, okay, how many people are searching? And if they search, uh, and then the users who search, do they tend to stick around on the site more or do they tend to leave more often? Uh, and if they search, 
So they tend to come back and use search again the day after and the day after that. Uh, and if, if it turns out that they actually don't engage any less than any other user, they come back and they use search a lot more, uh, then you know search actually might not suck and it might just be a user's impression. Uh, and what data can't tell us? Uh, it can't tell us what to do next. Um, you know, something that I think a lot of product managers worry about when they think of uh, data is that we're basically going to automate away their jobs. Data can't tell you that. It can tell you what you might test, what might be interesting, but it can't define your strategy. Your strategy is always driven by vision. Uh, it's always driven by user need, uh, and it's driven by kind of product market fit and how do you how you understand and, and where you see the company going. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it can't tell you causal relationships between ta past events. Two things might have been causal in the past, uh, but because you couldn't conduct a double-blind study, because you couldn't basically uh, split into a fractured universe and test those two different universes, uh, you, you just can't know. It also can't tell you when to make larger bets. Uh, data inherently, uh, and we'll talk about this in a minute, will will drive people to doing a lot of little incremental changes. when. In actuality, sometimes you might need to just make it a massive overhaul and just redo the whole thing. And relatedly, it can't tell you when you've hit relative maxima, when you've hit the, the top of a peak uh, and you need to basically adjust and change something drastically to go up again. So now we've talked a bit about data we're going to, and, and what it can and can't do, we're going to talk a bit about how we, how to collect data. You know, I think a, a lot of companies just kind of throw uh, Google Analytics up and have it puttering away in the background and, and glance at it occasionally. You know, I think that Google Analytics, I think, can be fine for understanding trends, for seeing where things are going. Um, but when it comes to actually really using data, I've found Google Analytics to be a little bit uh, lacking. In, in one respect, it, it does overcount. Uh, in my experience, I've seen as much as 40% overcounting. Um, in terms of total numbers. Uh, but the, the bigger thing is really uh, that it is sampling data. So it's not always showing you 100% of the data that you're look, you, you really need. So it's, it's basically surveying your users rather than capturing everything. And when you're looking to do really, really detailed data work, it's, it's just not sufficient. Um, so if you're looking at page views, I think Google Analytics can be fine. Um, and working through marketing, I think Google Analytics can be fine. But really, when you want to get really deep data and insights about your users, uh, you have to go deeper. Uh, Segment's a cool app if, if anybody's ever checked it out. Um, it's basically what, what's known as a data broker. Um, so you have all of your apps over here on the left-hand side. You can send all of your, your data into Segment, uh, all of your analytics, all of your user metrics into Segment, and then you can actually send off that data to a bunch of other sources. So then you can go try out a bunch of different data tools. Uh, it can also operate at the front end and back end, and, uh, and it has really uh, and reasonably accurate results. Uh, but eventually, what you're what you're going to need to get to is a place where you uh, will need to control kind of your own data destiny, where you inside your app somewhere you will need to actually be operating with the data, uh, because what you'll see here, and there's kind of the uh, you know the mix of these front end applications, your iOS, Android, your web apps. Uh, they are obviously where users are interacting with things, but the, the challenge of, of your front end here is that you're, you're not in control of the devices. Um, so what I've seen is uh, you've used Segment or Google Analytics or something like that, plugged it in actually at the, the front end, the, the JavaScript layer, um, and then a user comes in with a really old browser, and that browser breaks the JavaScript. It, the user can still use the site, but your tracking is broken. So if you're not collecting the tracking data from that segment of users, you're, you're missing some part of the population. Uh, and that's true of segment. It's true of Google Analytics. Um, what you need to get to ultimately is where you're plugging it in as close as possible to the back end. Uh, because under here, underneath the monolith, is your, your database. And that's really ultimately the source of truth. That's what users will ultimately uh, respond to and where they will need to and where your app will reflect the truth from now on. Um, so eventually, on a long enough time scale, um, you'll want to build your own data stack within your application. Now you can think of that like, like an evolution. I think it's fine to throw in Google Analytics in the early days, understand what users are doing at a, at a base level. When you're ready to go a step deeper, turn on segment 
and you can pipe it to a bunch of different applications. You can even have it write to a, a database that you can look at. And then, you know, when you're kind of reaching uh, the need for a, a deeper level of data understanding, it, it really needs to be um, a core part of your application. Uh, next, we're going to talk about basically what, what to measure. Uh, now that we've talked about um, what data can tell us and, and how we're going to collect it, uh, what, what should we actually be measuring? So first is growth. Uh, every application cares about growth. Um, I'm sure you've heard buzz around growth hackers and, and people like that and uh, companies trying to figure out ways of, of growing. Ultimately, every every company cares about eyeballs. And the first piece there is users and, and users or customers. Um, and those can be synonymous or they can even be a, a different things in a B2B uh, kind of context. Uh, the first thing is how many are coming in? Um, you know, just base count, give me an understanding of how many users and how many customers do I have. Uh, and then next, and then once you understand that, understanding where they come from, because ultimately you want to create more of them, right? Uh, after that, uh, once you understand where you, who your users are, who your customers are, and where they're coming from, it's ultimately about uh, keeping them and engaging them. Um, how many are coming back after 48 hours, one week, one month? You know. Different apps will have different retention intervals. Um, email obviously wants a user to come back every single day. Facebook wants an app, a user to come back every single day. But if you think about the broadest you know, product landscape, uh, a Mercedes is a product. Uh, you know, a high-end car is a product. They don't care that you come back every day. Nobody can afford a, well, I'm sure some people can afford a Mercedes every day, but I can't afford a Mercedes every day. Uh, so what they care about is when you do come back, whatever that, that refresh interval is that you come back to them. Um, so understanding retention, understanding the, the cycles of your app and what really makes sense for you in driving that. Uh, the next piece is if your app uh, has invites, uh, and most apps do these days, uh, is kind of understanding uh, what's known as k-factor. That's your, or your viral coefficient. Um, so of your users, uh, how many invites are you getting out of each user? Um, and how many of those invites are actually converting into uh, an additional user? So assume that uh, you have user one. They invite two people, uh, and one of them sticks around. Uh, so now you have basically a viral coefficient of one user turning into two users. And if that trend continues, if this user then invites two people and one sticks around, uh, that, that's a viral coefficient of one. Um, so each user basically brings in another user. That means your app isn't really viral. Uh, the viral coefficient needs to be higher than one uh, in order your k-factor needs to be higher than one uh, for you to have a viral app. But if you do, the good news is it doesn't have to be significantly higher than one uh, for your app to go viral. Uh, and that, that's really important to know. It just has to be higher than one. If it's less than one, uh, that means that every user that you bring in is actually negatively impacting your future ability to grow. Uh, so a k-factor below one is actually pretty bad. It'll mean that people get impressions of your app and don't really like it and won't come back. Um, so it's important that even as we talk through growth, you'll hear me kind of weave in stuff about engagement. We'll talk about engagement in a minute. Um, but, you know, if your app stinks, if nobody wants to use it, you know, all the viral, all the invites in the world aren't going to save you. Uh, and then the next piece to think about is if you have a lot of different viral elements. Yammer had, I think, three or four different viral elements. Uh, Facebook has probably thousands of viral elements at this point. It's really then about prioritizing uh, which of these viral elements is most effective and which one should we kind of double down on and continue investing in. After growth, I find apps kind of break down to these, uh, these two broad buckets. Um, one is uh, an inherently transactional app, uh, and one is an, uh, an engaging app. So a transactional app is something like e-commerce, uh, Amazon, um, you know, uh, any kind of app where you're, you're purchasing something and they're trying to drive you through a flow to make a final decision. An engaging app is the one that wants to keep you around uh, for other reasons. It's a, it's a social game. It's a social app. Um, it's something where you being there adds value, whether you're actually completing a transaction or not. So transactional apps ultimately care about uh, conversion, and they care about the funnel. Um, so you can think about the, this funnel here from the 2 million users that first hit the site, um, you know, 250,000 actually go on to purchase something with a, for a total conversion rate of about 12.5%. Uh, 
so as the product manager of a transactional app, ultimately what you're looking to do is optimize uh, these dips, uh, these drops in user between the various parts of the funnel. So if I look at this graph, I'm seeing that there's a 1 million user opportunity. We're, we're not converting a million users from this first uh, step of the funnel to the next. And so that's the next place I want to attack, because if I can drive that up, I already know it's pretty predictable from then on uh, how many people are going to purchase. Uh, so you can even, in a transactional app, you can almost have teams around each step of the funnel and optimizing it. Um, where people sometimes get a little blind in transactional apps is realizing that to the left of, uh, of that 2 million is the entire world, <laughs> the other <laughs> a few billion people in the world. Um, so if you try and just optimize within your funnel, even a transactional app, uh, forgetting about growth, forgetting about the other um, you know, billions of people that haven't actually seen your app, uh, you can kind of lose sight. You can get tunnel vision and optimize in the wrong way. So even a transactional app, you have to th be thinking broader. Uh, engaging apps uh, are a little bit different. Ultimately, they want you there. Um, they want you to sign in. They want to see page views. Time on site and page views are a little bit of a tricky metric, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but they're looking for interaction with the app. Uh, these interactions can be app-specific. App um, you know, Facebook is always going to care a lot about liking and replying. Instagram is going to care a lot about hearting. There's a common rule in uh, social apps called the 99-1 rule, which says that 1% uh, of people create content, 9% uh, of people uh, will respond to that content when the 1% create it, and that 90% are just going to lurk. They're never going to post anything. They're never going to like and reply. Uh, and the fascinating thing about engaging apps uh, is that that's OK, um, that they don't mind that 90% of the users aren't really going to do much besides just show up. Uh, the reason is, ultimately, because a lot of them are selling ads. And so you clicking off and, and going to another ad is valuable to them. Are you even seeing that ad and showing impression kind of data? Um, so beyond just the basic measurement of, of a user who showed up, uh, a lot of that will be app specific based on whatever your, you know, the outcome. Uh, and then there was a question there. What's the term again? I think it was uh, the term being the 991 rule. Yeah, there you go. Yep, and then once you kind of understand, you know, engagement and growth, then you can basically prioritize driving further engagement and growth. Um, I think I gave away the answer here. But the two most important interactions on Instagram, I'm actually not even an Instagram user all that much, so uh, <laughs> I would say it's, you know, liking, uh, or it's hearting, it's replying to things, it's uh, uh, resharing. You know, you can think about uh, all the different interactions and how they kind of not only do they engage that user, they engage other users, they drive more behavior, uh, and eventually will drive more eyeballs to ads. And that's why engaging apps care about those things a lot of the time. Uh, for my purposes, for, for Yammer, what we cared about, we, we charge companies money uh, for something that looked very much like Facebook, a, a social experience. Uh, but we cared about usage because usage drove uh, buying behavior, because it drove um, customers to renew. If people were getting value out of the software, they were using it to comment uh, and communicate with each other, uh, then customers were less likely to churn, and they were more likely to recommend the app to other people. Ultimately, your app is going to have both. Um, you know, within an engaging app, there are a bunch of funnels. Uh, you know, clash of clans. You know, they want you to get in there and, and battle all the other little villages, but they also want you to buy things. They want you to buy the coin upgrades and stuff like that. Uh, so that even within that you know, that loop, there are a bunch of little funnels that they want you to run through. Uh, similarly, uh, when, you, when you get to the end of that funnel uh, through Amazon, they, they want you to come back and buy more stuff. Uh, they don't just want you to go away. They want you to, like, tell your friends about it. They want to create that loop and get more people in. Um, but you have to prioritize one signal, uh, one of these flows. Uh, so the, you know, kind of the, uh, the thing to think about there is uh, when you're talking about an e-commerce app, they ultimately have a calculation, a, uh, a lifetime value that says, I, as a user, I'm going to be worth X thousand dollars. And the trade-off that they'll have to make is, if I'm coming back every single day and buying a pair of socks, uh, 
you know, that that's somewhat valuable to them, but depending on their profit margin for socks. But if I come back and I buy a big screen TV, high margins, they get paid a lot, and I hit that L, that lifetime value, they might actually care that I come back. If they can actually get me to do that, I might have hit the ceiling of what they're expecting out of me, and they might actually prioritize uh, me purchasing the TV rather than me coming back and using the site a lot more. As we're in the aging app, won't do that. If Clash of Clans realize that them pushing, buying of their little coin currency on, on the app um, causes me not to come back as often, they're not going to do that because they can get me in a bunch of other little ways. So although you're going to find elements of both in every application, you still have to prioritize one. And the thing to think about here is uh, which metrics are core. You know, the activities that we believe will lead to long-term business success, those form your, your core set of metrics. And those are things that you can't violate. Uh, whatever else you do, you cannot drive down K factor. You can't drive down user count. You can't drive down engagement. Um, and what that forms is kind of your backbone. Any test that you run, anytime you think about what to change, uh, you can't impact those metrics negatively. At some point, you know, you'll come to a point of optimization where you might need to make a trade-off between two different core metrics, but I'll tell you that that takes a really long time. Um, so if you ever see core metrics going down, uh, you know, you can assume safely that it's, it's a bad idea and you shouldn't do that thing. What you'll see a lot of the time is, is product managers really care about feature metrics. And the reason is somewhat cultural. You know, you give a product manager a feature and say, hey, could you go build this thing? They get really invested in it. Personally, um, they do a bunch of research, they work with design, they work with engineering. And when the, the feature ships, there's a natural inclination to say, well, people using it is inherently good. Uh, people searching more is valuable. Uh, but the, the flip side of that is if somebody searches more, but they come back to the site less and less, you know, that's a negative result. Um, you know, you have to think about the whole application and not just the individual feature and just the individual project that you're working on. So do track core and feature metrics, but core metrics win all the time. Uh, and then what not to measure. There are, you know, there are a million um, data and analytics type applications out there that are going to give you a bunch of really pretty dashboards and tell you what to measure. They're going to tell you a lot of the really easy stuff to measure, a lot of the really buzzy things that will make your numbers look good uh, because they're trying to sell you something. <laughs> so you just have to be really careful about what they're selling you and whether it really aligns with long-term business success. Uh, first one is clicks. You know, it's important to realize that clicks aren't always positive. Um, there's a, a funny app called Full Story um, that actually shows you users using your site. It shows them navigating around and their mouse moving and, and things like that. Uh, and they've got a funny metric on there called rage clicks. When somebody clicks something and it doesn't work and they click it a bunch of times, um, you know, clicking can, can signal that, that users are uh, kind of not understanding what's happening. Page view counts, um, you know, and I think this is something that uh, was learned the hard way by a lot of media companies. They saw higher page views as more chances to serve ads. So they optimized for page views rather than uh, actually looking at real uh, usage of the site. Uh, and because of that, you saw, you know, the, those 10 things to do on your vacation, whatever, and you go there and it's one of them. And then it's surrounded by like a thousand ads. And you click the next one, and there's another one, and it's surrounded by a thousand ads. You click the third one, and the third one is actually just an ad surrounded by a thousand ads, telling you to click on to see the real third one. You know, that's like bad user experience. I don't want to use that site, and people will not come back. Um, so page view counts are, you know, just a painfully obvious kind of perverse incentive uh, for product teams. Time on site, you know, I mentioned this before, it's not terrible data. Uh, but it is overemphasized, not objectively positive either for a similar kind of reason. Somebody could have just left the site open. Your tracking might not have been good. It's not consistent even within between browsers. Um, so people just hanging around isn't necessarily, um, you know, again, not, not a net positive all the time. What you really want to get to is understanding, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people when they look at data stuff will We'll try and figure out exactly what the numbers are. We'll say, this is where we are, and this is where we need to go, and, and set kind of these hard, arbitrary um, deadlines and, uh, and goals based on you know, specific numbers. 
what I can tell you about data anytime you collect it is it's inherently wrong in some way. You had to make some kind of choices, some kind of trade-offs in understanding how you got that data. There will be bugs in the code. There will be bugs in understanding how you got that code. And folks who are kind of pushing back on the idea of even using data are going to use that, you know, that inaccuracy um, to say that we shouldn't measure anything. Like, let's not use data because we can't be sure about the number. So when you're looking at data, when you're trying to understand what's happening in your application, uh, precision, you know, you can just assume that your precision is off uh, and not to really obsess over that. What is really important to obsess over, though, is trends. So I don't care about necessarily this, this P uh, on this curve, but what I do care about is that intersecting line you see. I want to know what this curve is, whether things are going up and to the right in the way that I think, uh, or whether this chart is actually trending in a different direction, whether it's trending flat or trending negative. That is incredibly important to understand. Uh, and the actual individual numbers, you know, when I talked about Google Analytics, aren't as relevant, um, unless you're putting them on a board slide and raising funding. Uh, other than that, you know, the, the individual numbers themselves are really just guides for you and how to think about it. Like, getting a little loud. Cool, thank you. So now that we, we have data, uh, we've uh, set our KPIs and we're thinking about how to, uh, to kind of move forward. The first thing you want to do is, once you have all of this data, is, is derive insights. And then once you have the data, uh, you can interrogate it. You can ask it all kinds of questions about uh, what it should be doing. You, this is how you start to derive your, your next concept. So you have the, the first set of core KPI, and now you have data that you think map to the KPI. And now you need to go and, and figure out uh, really what the data can tell you. Um, you know, you need to find that correlation. You need to find the uh, uh, divorce rate and the, uh, the margarine consumption and, and start to figure out what those relationships are. Uh, first thing you can do is basically ask ad hoc questions. Ad hoc questions are awesome. Just they can empower other teams, uh, first and foremost. You know, what behaviors that, uh, what are the behaviors that will correlate to paid upgrades? When do people actually give us money and why? Uh, and you can start to figure that out just based on those correlations in the data. Uh, which customers haven't logged in in a while? This is really powerful for your account management or your customer success team. They can tell you if nobody's using the app at a company. You know, that's a pretty good sign they're going to stop paying you if you don't figure out how to make that reverse. Uh, they can tell you what's worth working on in, in broad terms uh, based on how many people are viewing the page. You know, something you'll also get a lot as a product manager is uh, you know, a wide spectrum of usage, all the way from uh, somebody who never uses the app at all to somebody who uses it every day and obsesses about every single part of the application. Uh, these people on the, on the far end of the power user uh, curve are going to ask you for a bunch of weird stuff. It's going to be really, really detailed, really, really specific uh, to their usage. Um, but what you'll find is if you go look, in the data, they're going to tell you that not a lot of people even get to that part of the application. So is that really worth working on? Chances are no, unless you really, really care about those power users. They're giving you a particularly large amount of money uh, for some reason, or they're engaging a bunch of other users. Uh, but nine times out of 10, if you know less people are using the app than, than it's not, or that page, then it's not really worth uh, investing there. Uh, something as simple as like, should we build an Android app? Um, any, uh, we'll go, we can go to the uh, chat here. How, how would you determine uh, whether you should build an Android app? Any guesses there in the, uh, go ahead and put your answers in the chat. Any brave souls? Yep. Yep, that's right. So you also have the right, uh, the right answer. Yeah, you can look at, you can go back to Google Analytics. They've got a, uh, you know, that, that browser tab, and you can look, fire it up and say, hey, how many people are logging in from Android? And if it looks like a significant number of users are using your mobile site from Android, then that's a pretty good idea that, hey, maybe it's time to go actually invest in a, in a native Android application. You know, fascinating thing that happened to me at AnyPerk. I went and looked, and we had a massive number of uh, iOS users and a smaller number of Android users. We went and built the iOS app. Um, it it actually didn't really decrease the number of people browsing at us on iOS. It just actually rapidly expanded our total uh, market um, around the iOS app. So all the users that we got 
on iOS were actually additive. Um, and we still had a pretty healthy mobile um, app flow even from iOS. Uh, if you've never seen a, a cohort analysis, I'll explain kind of how this works. Cohort analysis is how you determine, um, you know, kind of the value of correlation based on two different values. Uh, so the values that we're looking at here are the, the cohorts on the left. Um, these are basically start dates or start weeks. Uh, and then on the, uh, the top row, it's how many weeks uh, um, did the users come back? Uh, so based on their start date, uh, how likely was it that they came back in week one through 17? Uh, and that gives you these, these percentage charts. Now, cohort based on date isn't a terribly useful um, metric here. Uh, but you can think about it, um, you know, you'll, you'll hear a lot in product literature about something called the aha moment, um, kind of a, a mythical um, creature that says when your application becomes really sticky and when people stick around. Uh, that's what a cohort analysis will tell you. Uh, so on your left here, you could imagine page views or feature use or something like that. And then on the top, again, if you have retention rates, uh, they can tell you whether using that feature led to long-term retention. So Dropbox counts their, their aha moment, and this is hilariously simple, is you install the app uh, and you drag a single file into that folder and they, they believe you'll be a good user uh, from there on. They have extremely high retention rates if they can convince you to drag one folder in or one file into the folder and sync it. Uh, and how you would do that is, a, is through cohort analysis. It's actually looking at retention rates of people who did that uh, and seeing if they were higher than people who did other things. Aha. Uh, the next piece you'll want to really think about is kind of dashboarding. You know, for my purposes, uh, you know, I think one of the most important things the product team can do is kind of evangelize product even within the organization, understanding what and why and how. You know, I think a lot of people look at product management and think that, uh, you know, you just show up to work one day and throw on your, your Steve Jobs turtleneck, uh, say yes and no a few times, and then the iPhone pops out. Um, that's, <laughs> that's obviously not what we do. <laughs> so uh, the important thing is kind of telling people, uh, what we care about, why we care about it. And then a big piece of that is just taking that data discipline and then putting it up all over the place, sharing your dashboards. And, uh, I don't even really know what the Copilot app is, but I just like it was a pretty dashboard. Um, you know, putting those dashboards up and around so everyone in the company understands what product's goals are uh, and that they are aware of data and how we're going to be using it to make the right decisions. You know, a fascinating thing, you know, that happened at Yammer also that we, we had um, graphs that would show week view versus prior week, month view versus prior month, and you can actually find anomalies in the data that way just by having the dashboards up and around. Something shows up big and bright and red on a dashboard, it doesn't take a, a product manager or a data analyst to come and say, hey, that's a thing that I need to do. You know, sales will walk by and say, hey, there's a red thing on that dashboard, and you're like, oh, uh, what, what is that red thing, and how do we fix it? Um, and then, you know, that starts the process of, of, again, diving back into the correlation, figuring out what you think happened, and then, and then trying to define whether there's a causal relationship there. Uh, this is a quote from my buddy Otis. Uh, there are only two honest visualizations, a line graph and a bar chart. Everything else is a sales pitch. Um, be careful when you look at dashboarding vendors. They're going to want to sell you a bunch of really pretty things. Um, I think pie charts can be used appropriately if you're careful. Um, but something that happened as soon as uh, um, we got bought by Microsoft is they started showing us uh, slices of their Kronos, or was it? I don't think it was called Kronos. What was it called? Um, anyway, their their big uh, their big data cluster, and every graph that they showed us, they there was just never a line graph and never a bar chart. And after a long time, it it became clear that. Uh, the data team were reporting to functional leaders within their organization. And those functional leaders didn't want to look bad. Uh, so they were obscuring all of the data in fancy looking graphs, hoping that you wouldn't realize that actually the graphs had nothing to do with user metrics. They actually had, were entirely about the data quality of the data they were collecting. They were going back and, and I told you not to worry about precision. They had 20 page presentations about the precision of their data. They were still trying to justify the usage of the data rather than actually deriving real insights. Um, so be careful with anything that, that isn't 
uh, a line graph and a bar chart because those are the most clear. Those are the most direct data points. Uh, and anything else, you know, radar graphs uh, that look like those spider things, um, you know, anything else can be ultimately confusing. Uh, on a long enough time scale, and especially if you're driving a funnel app or a transactional app, you do want to look at funnel visualization. You know, the the downside of funnel visualization is, again, it's a tunnel vision. If you keep staring at that funnel every day, it's going to look like it's the most important thing. Uh, when, you know, as you're, as you're staring at this funnel, it could be that everything around that funnel is actually way more important. There could be things that impact that funnel that you don't really understand. Uh, places where funnel visualization makes a lot of sense is actually sign-up flows. Um, you should definitely understand the different steps of your sign-up flow. Uh, but if you're looking at deep internals of the app, you just have to be really careful um, that, that your funnels don't don't make you narrow your uh, your focus on something that isn't really the, the kind of core of what you need to be accomplishing. Next, we'll get into multivariate testing. This this topic can go super deep. I've I've cut it to a uh, uh, what I think is a, a lighter weight version, uh, but uh, you can you can basically spend your whole career here, and a lot of people do. So I'll I'll start with a story. So you're the governor of an island, uh, and you realize that the best way for your island to start generating more money is to increase tourism. So the first thing you want to do is uh, start putting out brochures into uh, travel. Uh, travel agencies. You want to put them in a travel agencies. You want to take magazine spreads out. You know, and that's pretty effective. You know, you put out a, a travel brochure to a place nobody's heard of. You're going to start to get your, your adventure travelers, your first time people who are going to go to a place that nobody's ever heard of because they think it's cool to go to places that nobody ever heard of, which is great. You start to get a flow. You start to get money in. People are spending money and, and you're improving your economy of your island. What you find is, uh, you know, you're really just getting those adventure travelers. So what you want to do is, is take those adventure travelers and have them go brag about this place to their friends uh, so that they can bring in more revenue. Uh, so you create this little uh, Facebook photo booth, you put it in the airport, and now people can share their, their trips. Uh, and so those adventure travelers are starting to bring in kind of more of their friends. And those friends aren't necessarily, you know, the hardcore adventure travelers anymore. They're, um, you know, they're coming there to do other things. And this is great. Now you've got adventure travelers, you've got a wider group of people coming, but what you've noticed is, you know, once these people come, they, they don't really come back. Uh, they, they come in, they spend some money, and they leave. Uh, so what you want to do is, is find a way to, to keep people coming back to the island so they keep spending more money. So you start chartering helicopter rides. Now helicopter rides are, are cool and they're valuable, and you think that they're going to bring people back, but the challenge is uh, they don't necessarily impact the entire economy. Uh, why? Because the helicopter place is, is remote. It's far away from downtown, where most of the shops are, where people are mostly spending money. Uh, and so you want to be a bit scientific about it, because you don't want to uh, send a bunch of people off to take helicopter rides who don't spend money on the economy, and they just keep coming back to take the helicopter. Uh, so what you do is, uh, as people are landing in planes, you basically want to test on them. You want to give one plane that lands brochures about the helicopter rides, uh, see if they go on the helicopter rides, and then another plane that lands, don't don't tell them about it. Uh, and then basically measure the economic input uh, from each of those two different loads of planes. Uh, because if you have brochures out there that bring in first-time travelers, that then go and engage their friends, uh, that then come in, uh, spend money, and then later come back again to do a helicopter ride and continue spending more money with your uh, on your island, you've got a bustling economy. Uh, and in case you haven't noticed, that's a thinly veiled metaphor. You know, ultimately, when we talk about data, it's not actually statistics. It's actually economics. Attention is a currency, uh, and it's already basically spoken for. 100% uh, of people's time is already spent online in something else. So when you're looking to bring people into your site to, to take an action, you're competing with every other site in the world, every other thing in their lives. Uh, and you have to think about statistics as an economy. They've got a limited source, uh, a limited amount of uh, attention that they can spend, and they need to spend more of it with you. And that, that's kind of the way you need to think about it. One of the things, you know, uh, people who get business degrees often get a really bad rap uh, in technology. This is one of the things that I think people with MBAs and business degrees actually really excel at is economic modeling, uh, because that's really what we're doing. We're, we're getting people to spend attention. 
So what to test? You know, in a perfect world, in a, in a utopia, we would test everything. Uh, you know, Facebook has the ability with billions of users now that they can test something at 1% uh, and they can actually achieve uh, results and actually figure out what to do. We don't live in that world, though. We don't have billions of users ourselves. Uh, so we can't really test everything. Um, you know, something that also is worth thinking about is just sample size. So when you're thinking about testing, when you want to test, you have to kind of understand whether the users that you have have today are representative of the users that you want in the future. When we go talk to a, a VC and say, hey, I want money, you know, we don't tell them that we want, you know, these five little smiling people over here. We paint this broad picture of all of these people in the world that we want to use our thing. Uh, but those five happy people, those early adopters, those adventure travelers are, might be weird. Um, so even in the early days, you can't necessarily A-B test on these five happy people and assume that it's actually going to correlate and it's going to do anything for the broader market that you care about. So in the early days, uh, I would actually suggest people don't A-B test early on um, because that sample just might not be representative of, of the people that you really need to bring in. So early days, it's more about user research and getting out there and talking to people than it really is about A-B testing. It's also important to note that testing costs. It has costs. Uh, it slows time to delivery. If you have to build the infrastructure around executing a, an A-B test, um, that slows engineering down, and that's, that's time you could have spent building another uh, feature that might even be more engaging. It adds to code complexity. You have to have some kind of way of uh, managing the, the testing infrastructure, uh, and you have to have basically two variants of the code living in production at any given time. Your QA team has to test every different version that ships out the door. And then all the other PMs and designers have to know about tests because tests can overlap and they can interact with each other. Um, so as you think about, about testing, you have to think about you know, whether it's really worth the cost of what you're doing. And of course, uh, the last thing, you know, users don't really love the idea. Uh, I think anybody who's uh, experienced uh, an EB test or looked at their site, not as uh, obvious now these days, but especially in the early days of a lot of these social apps, Two people would see two drastically different things and be like, wait a minute, why am I seeing this weird situation? So all of these things have to be kind of considered when you think about what you want to test. Something, an early heuristic that I recommend, especially for a social application, is really only to test features that impact like 30% of your users. So if you've got a page, you know, three clicks in, you really want to deliver a feature there, uh, but less than 30% of your users are actually getting there, it's probably not worth the effort. It's probably not worth the cost, and you should just do your best. Uh, maybe user test that area for UX purposes, uh, but it, it might not be worth uh, the total investment. There are plenty of A-B testing tools. Um, these are just a handful. You can go on uh, G2 Crowd and find hundreds. You know, KISS Metrics, uh, Visual Website Optimizer, Unbounce, Optimizely, Google Analytics. Uh, these will get you some interesting uh, kind of results, but you have to be a little bit careful with what they tell you. You know, going back to my uh, my earlier point about, um, you know, dashboards and visualization, they're gonna give you metrics that are really buzzy, that are really easy to measure. Uh, the really easy to measure stuff is inherently not the most valuable uh, things. So these will let you test small changes. They'll let you test copy, color, button position, things like that, but the, the fascinating thing is if you want to get really deep, you know, the, the thing that you really want to test are flows. Um, flows through the application are what tell you most about what's changed and what's valuable. So those small optimizations don't, you know, they can net you changes, but they can't necessarily make the big changes that you need. The, the changes in user behavior are driven through um, the progression that users take through your application. And what you'll find is if you use any of those applications, you want to test a flow, it's a fact you might as well have built it yourself. They, they just don't give you that much additional value in flow testing. You know, and a lot of people will complain, you know, about over testing uh, versus intuition. You know, there's a, it's, this is a case study that, that became popular when a designer kind of rage quit Google at one point because Google uh, couldn't decide between shades of blue, so they tested 41 different shades. Uh, of blue. Now, I get the designer's frustration in, in that piece that, that we should be able to use intuition and make the right color about blue, 
the flip side of that, I also get the product manager's points that, you know, if you have billions of users, 41 shades actually might be valuable. Uh, but again, going back to it, I think the big thing to take away there is that uh, data doesn't remove the need for intuition from the product manager. We had a situation at Yammer where we developed the marketing team, replaced the landing page, and it drastically uh, impacted signups. We had 30% fewer signups uh, with the new version than we had with the previous. So when we put a PM on it to fix the situation, he came back and said, there, these are the six things that I want to test. And I said, okay, of those six things, what do you think is actually going to be most valuable? Uh, which of these six do you think is actually going to work? Um, because that's, that's ultimately our job, is not to test 41 different things or even six different things. It's to use our intuition to short circuit that process and test a couple. The other thing you'll find, especially in a, an app that doesn't have billions of users, uh, the more uh, things that you test, the less likely it is that you're going to get to statistical significance, that your results are going to be scientifically accurate and that they're actually going to tell you anything useful. So testing six different sign-up flows for us was basically going to be noise. We, we wouldn't have gotten to one of them being perfect or even better than the current situation is um, because the numbers would just sort of cluster. So I'm going to make a bet with you uh, for a million dollars. And here, here are the ground rules. Uh, the competition is going to last two years. Uh, and our, our goal is to find the uh, highest thing that we can place a flag on. Um, highest object in the world, highest place in the world that we can get and, and put a flag. Uh, once a flag is on that thing, um, the other competitor can't put their flag there. So we basically claim uh, that building, that mountain, whatever. Uh, we're both going to start in San Francisco with $10,000. Uh, you can borrow more, um, but you, then you don't win as much from the bet. So what would your strategy be? Well, you could go to the uh, Transamerica Pyramid. That's uh, currently the tallest building in San Francisco. That's pretty easy to get to. Um, just hop over and, and run your way up to the top. Um, but once one of us gets there, the other one can't claim it. So that they'll be looking for kind of the next biggest thing. Uh, you could hop a plane then and go to Chicago. You know, that, that'll, that's definitely less than $10,000. You can go up to the top of the Willis Tower. Uh, that's the you know, next tallest building, or it's one of the tallest buildings in the US, um, and you can claim that. Uh, then you could basically go to One World Trade, you know, the other person could, could hop a plane then to New York, not that much more expensive, and uh, now that is the tallest building in the US, and so now you've claimed the, the tallest building in the United States, but now you'd be getting a little bit worried about money, um, because you've had to travel to New York, uh, you've had to spend the money, there's probably hotels and flights and all that kind of stuff, um, so you, you'll start to get a little bit worried about your funding, when you could have actually stayed in uh, California and climbed up to the top of Mount Hood, which is the, the tallest peak in California, it's 12,000 feet, taller than any building in the US. Um, you know, and then what is the other person gonna do? How are they gonna counter it? Well, you could just say, well, forget it. I'm just gonna go for Everest. I'm gonna spend all $10,000. I'm gonna raise some more because it's, I think it's 60,000 just to get up there, much less all the training and flights and travel and all that kind of stuff. Um, but how do you know that that's the right thing? When you, when you get to base camp, when you get to you know, the, the first level of the mountain, how do you know that that was the right place? And how do you, you know, make the decision to turn around before you die on the mountain? Uh, you know, that, ultimately, that, that journey is your product. You know, you're, you start building. Uh, you start to climb these, these hills. And you have to be constantly looking for the future, what the next big peak is. You know, you start, you might be here on the curve, and this is from uh, actually a Facebook presentation called uh, um, Local Maxima, or about Local Maxima and, and data-driven product development. You know, you could be standing here and looking and thinking you understand where you're going, but you could be marching up a hill that, that's just not all that high. And it could take actually a drastic rethinking of what you need to do to, to find that, that bigger peak. And this is ultimately one of the, uh, the challenges of data is that they can't tell you necessarily when to go from one to the other. Uh, you might see that you're getting smaller and smaller impacts on the work that you're doing, and that might hint to you that you're hitting a, a local maxima. But sometimes you really need to be thinking above and beyond. Uh, you need to be thinking for that, that broad peak, thinking of what that Everest might be, and then using data to inform how you get there rather than um, you know, tell you when it's time to go. 
And so when we talk about A-B testing, we're, you know, the, the classical model is what's known as, um, you know, frequentist probability. Uh, when you're testing these things that uh, you, you'll recognize this from science class, that you have a group of people, um, you give one person, one group the new thing and one group the old thing, and then you basically see what their behaviors are afterwards. Um, so you'll be wanting to measure test data in, in kind of two big buckets. Aggregates um, are basically counts of number of times that things happened, uh, and then binaries, uh, whether a thing happened. Neither, I would say of the two, binaries are the truer metric um, because uh, aggregates can get goofed up in uh, very specific ways. If you have your two treatment groups and it looks like this group sent a lot more invites and this group sent a lot less, what you might actually find in this group is you have one person who actually sent out like 5,000 invites and actually messed up your aggregate count. Um, so that's when you use binaries to kind of check your, um, uh, check your data against itself. So you look at the binaries and say, okay, how many people did invite? not just you know, how many total invites were sent based on the two different things. Uh, so when you're A-B testing, you'll be looking at uh, kind of both pieces of data. And this is what your, uh, your test results might look like. Um, I won't go too deep in here, but you can see this is a, this is a two-part test uh, that Yammer tested actually after I left where they were considering shortening the sign-up flow. Shortening the sign-up flow is one of those things that uh, always seems like a good idea, but actually has uh, some implications in, in terms of investment bias. Um, so we had, uh, there were two different, we had a four-step sign-up flow, and then there was one where we uh, removed that, that sign-up step. So it was a three-step flow, and then a, a modal when you get into the product to add a profile photo later. Uh, and so this lift, you can see here, average days engaged per user per week is negative. Uh, average days engaged per user per week, uh, you know, first week per user is also negative. So a negative lift means it, it went down. These are our core metrics here, number of users engaged, one day retention. All of these were negative kind of across the board. Uh, and then these p-values, which you also might recognize from science class, are basically your measure of significance. So this tells you, you know, you'll always get a result, but this will tell you how likely it is that that result is actually accurate, that that result will be deterministic for future users who have that. Um, so, you know, science usually wants to go below like 0 0.03, um, like here under uh, number of users who engaged. We ultimately aren't scientists. We can be a little bit fudgier with these numbers, but uh, p-value is a really important thing to understand. I won't go... Uh, I've got a longer version of this presentation where I go way too deep into, into p-values, but it's worth really digging deep and understanding that um, when you get a chance. So ultimately, this is a, this is a failed experiment. Um, we broke core metrics uh, with the test, even though it seemed objectively better. And that is something that uh, is really important. You will think that things will be better, and they will not perform well, and you will have to change your assumptions about what you thought was better. Uh, a lot of times what you're going to see these days is actually what's known as Bayesian probability. Uh, the reason it's popular now and it hadn't been popular in the past is Moore's law. It's really, uh, it takes a lot of computational power um, to compute Bayesian probability versus frequentist probability. Um, the big change in frequentist is frequentist says, I don't care about what happened in the past. I'm going to test this thing in a vacuum uh, and I'm going to go with whatever the outcome is. Uh, Bayesian probability brings in that, that prior belief. It says, okay, um, you know, you have batting averages, you know, a frequentist would say, what is the batting average batting average for, or what is the range of batting averages for uh, really good cricket players? Um, a frequentist will basically start from today and measure cricket players going forward. A Bayesian uh, probability will actually take into account all prior uh, cricket players and, and their batting averages uh, before getting into the test. Um, so it can, and the outcome is a little bit different in that instead of a p-value, instead of a, uh, you know, a measure of whether or not those results were significant, uh, it actually will give you an interval. Um, say that we believe that based on all prior data, everything in this test period, that everybody's going to fall kind of within this band. Uh, and then you can kind of, um, uh, and then it actually will try and basically tell you what to expect when you ship it. So a frequentist um, A-B test won't actually tell you what the outcome will necessarily be when you actually ship it to production because it doesn't take into account any of the past um, data. A Bayesian, uh, uh, a Bayesian model of A-B testing will actually try and predict what the outcome will be when you actually ship it to production. <laughs> 
And so after all of that, I think, you know, hopefully if I didn't drive any points home, it's ultimately that uh, multivariate testing doesn't replace intuition. It just makes outcomes clearer. When you're marching along that hill, when you're trying to find the tallest building, when you're trying to increase the revenue in your island, uh, that you need to have data that tells you whether every step you're taking is valuable. And if you do, then you're, you're making great strides, that you can kind of do anything. And that, that's the path that these companies get on uh, when they become these data juggernauts. It's that they're taking data-driven, data-explained steps uh, that reinforce uh, their intuition and make sure that they make the right decisions. You know, when you're thinking about all of this too, it's, it's really hard for companies to change. You know, I saw this at Microsoft all the time. Um, driving home that, that culture of experimentation, that idea that, you know, my idea might actually be wrong, uh, is it's really hard for people. Uh, and it's part of, you know, our jobs as product managers to bring that out. Uh, you know, when you're thinking about experimentation culture, you know, this is, uh, this is the Wikipedia page for cognitive bias. Um, I love going there, you know, every few months just to, um, you know, uh, check my own ego because uh, the page keeps growing. You know, humans have, uh, incredibly flawed understandings of the world based on how our brain mechanics, our social interactions, uh, we're blind to a lot of things and we're inherently wrong about many, many other things. So when you first think about how to drive home the, the culture of experimentation, you have to kind of start with the idea that, you know, I'm not always right. Uh, and in fact, I'm probably wrong a lot and probably even more than I, uh, uh, than I want to be or even understand at this point. So something I like to point to, Google did a study a few years ago um, where they took their very, very best product managers, the ones who were on the fast track within Google. And they were thinking, okay, well, people on the fast track must actually ship more successful features. They must actually move metrics. So they looked at it. They looked at that, that correlation. What they found is that when the very best product managers at Google were trying to ship features that were intended to drive metrics up, uh, that effectively, you know, about 33% or about a third of the time they failed. Uh, they failed to drive the metrics up. About a third of the time the metrics were flat. Uh, and about a third of the time they were actually successful in driving metrics up. Uh, so the very best product managers at Google are wrong. <laughs> uh, I think my math is wrong here. It's 67% of the time. The very best product managers are wrong uh, a significant portion of the time. And that you know, I think that really helps to drive home the fact that, you know, when people think about data, when, are you, that it has nothing to do with intelligence. It has nothing to do with skill. It has everything to do with your understanding of the world and whether you can understand enough about the users. Uh, and also, you know, what Google was also, you know, on the verge of doing here was uh, rewarding people only for success. And what that will do is make sure that you only ever have small iterative projects, that you will never actually try for the big mountain because people will be afraid of going after the big mountain. They'll be afraid of failure. So you can't, you also can't build a compensation structure around uh, movement of metrics for that reason because you'll inhibit people from actually taking chances. And then you also have to really redefine success for your engineers. Your engineers believe that uh, putting a product out there and getting users' hands on it is uh, the value of, of what they do. And in A-B testing, it will very likely happen. That the thing that they're building will not do anything. It won't, it won't actually ship to product, or it won't actually ship to 100% of users. It won't become a core part of the product framework from now on. Um, so you really need to get engineering excited around the idea of getting the code out there uh, and then either, and then learning. Uh, but it's not just about getting their code into people's hands, uh, into 100% of users' hands, but it's really about uh, testing, iterating, and making sure you're doing the right thing. Uh, you know, to some extent, machine learning is uh, just another version of the magical algorithm. You know, product managers have been promised the magical algorithm from engineers for years. Um, and to users, it's kind of the same thing. I don't care about machine learning. I care about what machine learning can do for users. And I care about the ability for me to use it as a tool in my toolbox to improve my product. Uh, so we'll talk really briefly um, about this. First is uh, what's known as a recommender system. Uh, a lot of recommender systems are actually built based off of something called collaborative filtering, which basically says if this guy on the left is a biker and this guy on the right is a biker and they seem to have similar buying habits and then the guy on the right does something that's a little bit different than the guy on the left, that hey, maybe the guy on the left might like that too. 
Yeah, that's collaborative filtering. You, you can do it a lot of different ways, but that's kind of the core. It's taking different groups of users, finding kind of behavior around those groups, kind of at the margins of those groups, and trying to bring it into the core and seeing if it actually works. Uh, natural language processing NLP um, is actually kind of a roll up of a bunch of different concepts of machine learning um, from uh, you know, the core of natural language processing has Bayesian probability in it. It has uh, the, the same underlying um, concepts behind anti-spam. Uh, so there's a lot of different pieces that fall into natural language processing. Um, and I think it's, it's a broader field that you want to look into, kind of all the, the different component parts. Um, you know, not just get caught up on chatbots and, uh, and, you know, the different incarnations of uh, virtual assistants. We're really looking at, you know, how machines understand what, people, what input people are getting. Uh, and then there's a lot of different applications for the underlying technology there. Uh, one thing that I'm particularly fascinated in, and it's kind of an emerging field, it's called dimensionality reduction. We talked before about doing cohort analysis. What dimensionality reduction can do is say, okay, if your user, your user is this multifaceted person, they're doing a bunch of different stuff. They're clicking here, they're doing that, they're taking all these different actions. And when you look at a cohort analysis, you need to go basically feature by feature and see users, whether they used it and how that works. What, uh, so what you can think of as you're building this construct of a user is that uh, if you were to try and graph their usage, um, it would be like a 61 dimensional graph. You, you can't even like conceive of it in your head what this user is doing and, and how to actually like rationalize comparing this user's usage graph, this, this crazy thing over here um, to another user. So what dimensionality reduction does is it basically says, you know, we can flatten a lot of these things. Uh, this is just more, more math, but you can take these concepts and you can just flatten them out um, into these, uh, into these uh, single vectors of what people are doing through your app. And you can actually compare those. Uh, and you can find the path, the most likely path that people take through your, uh, to become power users in your site. And you can actually take them stepwise through that. Cool, so that was a extremely brief machine learning. <laughs> um, but those are the kind of the three biggest ones I think that, uh, that PMs need to be aware of. Um, so yeah, so we, thanks, for, we talked today about the character of data, what it can do for us, what it can't, uh, how to collect it, what we want to measure, um, how to gain insights from that. Talking about, we talked about dashboards and reporting and how to kind of share that out to everybody and why that's important. Um, took a bit of time on the uh, multivariate testing um, and, and the successes and, and the challenges of it. Uh, and then a really brief overview on uh, machine learning. So now I think people have asked some questions in, but we'll go ahead and uh, um, fire up if anybody has any questions they want to. Uh, yeah, so there's a good question back here from uh, Assis, how to balance between intuition-based decision, not doing costly experiment versus businesses, versus, uh, um, you know, the bias of, of making those decisions. You know, I think it's um, one, you know, you can look at your usage metrics and figure out, A, you know, is this a really important thing for me to test, that the 30% kind of heuristic that I threw out earlier. Um, the second is, you know, really how well do I understand that area? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, you know, basically Schedule O isn't doing a lot of this stuff right now. And that because A, we're still very much uh, early stages and thesis driven, but B, it's just certain things about the app are so necessary, they're so objectively needed um, that although I'd love to, you know, A-B test the UX of that thing, the thing just needs to exist. Like I just need to create that feature. Um, so I, some things can be objectively true, and some features do need to just exist. I'll take off that slide. It's so distracting. Keep popping in questions here. I'll talk a little bit more. Um, so the uh, this is a longer blog post um, here on my Medium page. You can check it out at that Bitly link over there, Bitly uh, forward slash DD product. Um, there's also my LinkedIn, Twitter, Medium, etc. A million ways to, to keep in contact with me. So so please do. What is the best suite to implement for data management reporting recommendations like Google product suites, uh, Adobe product suites, et cetera? I would say I don't know of a single product suite that has kind of everything. Um, I think Mixpanel tries to do that, um, but uh, I think it's extremely expensive to start with. <laughs> so that's, that's probably one, uh, one thing that might uh, lean you away from it. What I would recommend is trying out, actually looking at segment 
because um, segment can, once you start pumping your data in a segment, it can actually shove that data in a bunch of different apps. And the cool thing is then it's just a button click uh, to turn those apps on. So I was looking at um, funnel um, visualization software at one point. I was looking at Mixpanel. I was looking at Heap. And I was able to just basically go sign up for the free trials, click the buttons, and just it would just start working. And then I was able to try them out both um, at the same time and figure out what I liked and what I didn't like. Uh, PM resources I recommend. Uh, I definitely recommend Quora. Uh, that's, that's one of my favorites. Um, and that's kind of how I got myself excited about blogging um, way back when. Um, you know, I think product to some extent is a, an apprenticeship position. Uh, so definitely find mentors and people you can learn from locally. Uh, you know, I know people actually, I know product managers, uh, at least in the NOIDA area, um, that I've you know liked and re really hope, uh, enjoyed working with that I might be able to recommend. Uh, the right time to start using cohort analysis. Uh, I, I don't think there's, you know, assuming you have a data set that you're happy with, I don't think it's too, ever too early. Uh, to start using cohort analysis. Uh, it's kind of one of the first baseline, like what are people doing uh, kind of things. It is time consuming. Uh, and I find that, uh, you know, I when I joined any perk, it was 15 people. I didn't have a data person, so I had to do all the cohort analysis myself. And it took three or four weeks. Um, you know, it's, so just be prepared to, for the fact that that's kind of an expensive um, thing, but it's that's one of those that I would recommend investing in early. Uh, best resources for machine learning for product managers. You know, I, I really like, um, I think it's Udacity has a, like an intro to AI course. Uh, it is very, it'll be very math heavy. Um, and so if you've got a math background, that, that'll fit your style a bit more. The, uh, another thing to check out, there's a guy named uh, Frank Chen who runs research um, for Andreessen Horowitz. And he's got a great recorded presentation. You can find the YouTube video um, where he kind of gives an overview of machine learning, what it can do, what it, what it can't do, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, what I try and do, and I, something I just recommend in general, is pick a technical topic every year uh, to try and learn about. I don't think, and you know, I don't think you have to have been a computer science major to be a great PM, uh, but I do think you need to understand the tools. Um, you know, the same way a, a painter doesn't need to, you know, be a chemist to understand, uh, you know, exactly how their paint is made, but they do need to understand the process of making paint so that they can understand, you know, why a certain set of paint is going to be better for them. Uh, my my journey, my journey, um, you know, I think I I started initially, you know, every every product manager has a different story, and I think that that speaks to the fact that it is an apprenticeship position, and, and somebody eventually just needs to give you a a chance to do it. Um, I initially. Uh, even in high school, I was interning as a graphic designer. Uh, that was always my passion, was actually design and, and art. Um, one day, my uh, my boss took me into his into his office, and he had all these beautiful hand drawings and paintings all over his office. Uh, and I decided to show him my, uh, my fine art portfolio, my really artistic stuff. And uh, he basically told me that I could do that, um, but I would die alone and starving. Um, or I could get a job at graphic design and make money and have a family and a house and uh, a nice life. <laughs> and uh, I decided I was going, if I was going to sell out, I was going to become an engineer um, and get more money anyway. <laughs> so, but I came out of school, I, I was a developer for a couple of years, uh, pretty quickly realized that, you know, I, I was that engineer that you're going to run into in your career that you really hate dealing with, the one who gets the thing to like 90% and it looks great. Um, but you know it's still buggy and it's not quite done, and then just cannot finish that that final ten percent. Uh, and when I realized that about myself, I realized I was never going to be a great engineer. Went then uh, I got recruited to a Bay Area startup as a sales engineer. Um, went around and it was a highly technical product uh, that we sold kind of all over the world, um, which is where I you know when I've been to India to visit my team there and actually to sell the product um, to, the, to Mitsubishi. Um, but, uh, yeah, and then there was a, it was always the path in an old school enterprise company that sales engineers were kind of your natural recruiting path for product managers because they were technical and they could talk to people, uh, as well engineers can't. 
And then, yeah, been stuck in, uh, in product kind of ever since. Uh, business metrics versus uh, feature metrics, I think. Um, I would, you know, when I think of business metrics, when I think of top level company KPI, um, things like revenue, uh, churn, you know, those are valuable and important, but they're ultimately lagging indicators. Uh, my old VP of sales used to tell me that a feature that wasn't shipped by May 15th couldn't impact his revenue that year. Uh, so the, the flip side of that is if I ship something, you know, middle of June and I'm trying to take credit for a big revenue bump in Q3, it probably isn't really right. Um, you know, it, it's just lagging. You, you can't know that the thing that you did, similar to our Archduke Franz Ferdinand situation, we, there's no really way to like A-B test revenue uh, and feature impact on revenue. So what you have to do when you're building your, your core metrics, you have to basically have the faith that those core metrics are going to add up to the top line business metrics. You should be constantly kind of validating those hypotheses, um, but uh, that, that's kind of where you need to go with that. Cool. So that seems like the end of the uh, questions. But do I mean do connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Medium, Quora, Carrier Pigeon, uh, throw a ball of paper across the uh, Pacific, <laughs> and I'll uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Pish. Yes. Thank you, Andrew, for joining us today. Session was really helpful, and I hope everyone would have enjoyed the session. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. In case you have any queries related to product management, you can anytime reach to Andrew and you can also reach out to me if you're looking for transition into product management. Uh, we have built a course and uh, along with the course, we have our intensive bootcamp where you build a build and ship a real product by pairing up with an in-house team. And also before ending, I would like to tell you that we have very interesting sessions lined up so check out our website i am sharing the link of our website for our upcoming sessions you can register for the sessions over there and that's all thanks a lot for joining yep thanks thank you drew. everybody thank you drew talvinder here thank you so much i just thank thought uh, after everything is done i'll just bump in i jump in <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah i was i was a passive listener throughout it was a very very enjoyable session especially like the hills example uh, i had written an old article about i don't know four three four years back where in uh, incidentally i had used exactly the same diagram uh, to explain global maxima and local maxima when you're trying yep. to maximize something yep uh, so i was very happy to see that <laughs> <laughs> yeah but once again thank you so much for uh, for taking on the time and uh, giving a fantastic overview of, of data it's such a wide ranging topic, but you covered right. it very, very well. Thank you so much. Yep, thank you, Tavinder. Yeah, take care.